Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Back in 2018, AAA, the automotive and financial and other things that they do company, uh, put out a study and they were interested in learning the opinion of Americans of how comfortable they would be in riding in a fully self-driving car. And in, they had found some stats and in fact the opinion of people and the confidence and, and how comfortable they would be actually went down from previous years and you can think back, that's kind of when all those accidents were starting to happen with self-driving cars. But that wasn't really the intriguing thing about this uh, study. Sure, it helped them figure things out with that, but, but what came to light was this. In their study, as they were asking people about their comfortability in a self-driving car, they also asked people to rate themselves as a driver, and what do you think of yourself as a driver? And they found that 73% of Americans consider themselves an above-average driver. That's really intriguing, especially when you think about, as the study pointed, that 8 out of 10 accidents happen because of human error. And then you consider the math of what's going on. 73% consider themselves above average. So that means more than the average consider themselves to be above it. We really have a high opinion of ourselves driving, and perhaps you can understand that too in your own life. You might be thinking, I'm a pretty good driver. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you think you are. But you know what it's like. You're driving down the road and you see someone and you look over as they're whipping by you doing 90 with the trailer on them and they're texting and you think, how in the world could they possibly be doing something like that? They are going to kill us all. Or maybe you see that person who's got their face just dripping in ketchup and mustard as they're eating their burger and fries and you're thinking, you're not really focused on the road. You're focused on eating. What is going on? I need to get away from that person as soon as possible. And as you do, kind of that smug attitude settles in of how I don't do that as I hit next and search for the next podcast to find on my phone, just as distracted as them. We have this overestimation of our abilities in driving, yes, but it also affects us in a lot of different ways. It affects us in our lives as we think about our relationships with people. I'm a, I'm a pretty above average father or parent or or brother, or student, or whatever it might be, we, we can do that, we can fall into that, because that's the natural way of the world. To think of me first, and to think of me as being one of the better people. What we're dealing with when we have that is our pride. And today Jesus wants to address our pride, and the danger of what pride is. And in doing so, he teaches us not the way of the world, but the way of of how a Christian acts in the world. And a Christian acts, he says, with a humble attitude and unselfish actions. We're going to learn this as Jesus confronts some Pharisees about their pride and their arrogance, and then as he teaches them and us the way of the Christian. We read from Luke chapter 14, verses 1, and then 7 through 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. When he, Jesus, noticed how the guest, guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat, then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited... Take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the, guests, all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the gospel of our Lord. Jesus was eating at a Pharisee's house, and he did this often. He ate with a lot of people, with sinners and tax collectors, but also 
the Pharisees. And the Pharisees invited him over this time, especially a prominent Pharisee, perhaps one of the guys on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling committee, for a purpose. They were watching Jesus. They wanted to test him. They were always testing Jesus to see if he was who he said he was, or more specifically, as we know from reading the rest of the Gospels, to prove, disprove who he said who he was. So once more they were watching Jesus, watching him carefully, looking for an opportunity to try and disprove his claims as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who had come here to save his people and to forgive the sins of the whole world. In the verses in between, verses 2 through 6, we see that test take place. And Jesus answered it and passed with flying colors, as Jesus always does. But, but the Pharisees at this banquet, as they were eating with this uh, revered rabbi, the Son of God, our Savior, didn't realize that Jesus was watching them too. And Jesus was watching them as they were gathering around the table, as they were looking for the place of honor, that they could all sit in the most honorable, the most respected, the most prominent place, so that what? They could receive the praise and honor of everyone else, that they could feel good about themselves, that they are important, whether it's being included in the, the really good discussion or sitting next to someone who's really important. They wanted to be there. Jesus was watching them and he needed to teach them about humility. And he needed to call out their pride because that was something that plagued the Pharisees a lot. They thought they were pretty good. They thought that they deserved God's favor. They thought they, did, they deserved all that because A, they were the children of Abraham, descendant from Abraham, the Jewish people, God's chosen people. But also because they kept God's law so well. They were the ones, and they were respected in society, that you wanted to model your life off of if you were just an average person because they kept the rules. They followed what God said, and they were respected for it. But they thought they deserved God's favor because of that. And they wanted and clamored for the honor and respect of people. You can see that especially as we go a few chapters later in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. That's the parable Jesus was telling where there's the Pharisee and he... Uh, stands in front of the temple and what does he say? I thank you, Lord, that I am not like one of these, proud, arrogant, thinking that he deserves the praise of people and the praise of God. And there in the corner is a tax collector that says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Even though that was a parable, it reflected the attitude that the Pharisees had to seek the honor of people, to gain the most respectable place, to puff themselves up because they thought they were so good. So Jesus needed to call them to repentance and to teach them the way of a Christian. It's a humble way, a humble attitude. So he tells a parable, and it's, it's pretty easy to go through. It's not too confusing. There's a banquet being thrown, and the guest chooses. He walks in. He's excited to be there at the wedding feast, and he sees the best spot, maybe right up by the head table, for a number of reasons. One, he knows he might sit by the bride and the groom or the really important people or the people connected to them and that brings honor and prestige and he's thinking that's a great spot to be. And so he sits down until the host has to come and say, no, that's not your spot. And in front of everybody, he has to stand up and walk to the least important spot. The shame, the humiliation. At first, it seems like Jesus is just teaching about party etiquette. Sit at the lowest place, right? Then your host will come and say, there's a better spot for you. Move up, and, and there's great party etiquette. There's great banquet etiquette, right? But no, it's more than that. Jesus is trying to teach spiritual truths. This isn't just how we behave out in public. It's the attitude which we have in our hearts. And he says that with that last line. He says, the exalted, those who exalt themselves, will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Like I said, he wasn't just speaking about party etiquette. He was speaking spiritually. Focusing on us and the Pharisees on our relationship with God. Like I said, the Pharisees, they thought they deserved God's favor. They exalted themselves. And what did they depend on? What they did. How good they were. Their pride. Their arrogance. All that separated them from God because that's what pride does. Pride is such a devious and dangerous little sin. It starts off small, but its roots go deep. And it can, it can seem so innocent because you're not hurting anyone. You're thinking highly of yourself. But what it turns us away from is our realization of the need that we have of our Savior. 
like the Pharisees, we can think we're pretty good. We can puff ourselves up and depend on what we do. And I'm not just speaking about how good of drivers we are or how good of brothers or parents we are, but ultimately how we are as God's people. That temptation to be proud and to puff yourself up, to exalt yourself can happen when you're sitting in the pew of a congregation. To think, I'm here, where's everyone else? And instead of thinking that out of concern, it's out of arrogance. It's out of exalting myself and making myself feel better because of it. Or when I serve in church or at school or in my home, wherever it might be, I can think, I'm doing this, look at how good I am, where's everyone else? And instead of thinking that out of concern or the joy of wanting to get more people involved, it's that puffing myself up. I'm one of the more above average Christians. Look at how good I am. That temptation to pride can separate us because ultimately what will it do? It makes us think we are better than who we are. makes us think that we can depend on our own actions instead of Christ. That's why those words are important for us to hear. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. What Jesus wants us to realize through his word, through this call to repentance, is that we need to be humbled. We need to recognize who we are. And we do that each and every Sunday as we confess our sins, that we are not worthy of God's favor. We are not worthy of eternal life. What we are worthy of, though, is condemnation punishment in hell. We are sinners who deserve God's wrath. We are nothing but beggars. All we can do is hold out our hand and hope. But the good news is, that's why Jesus came. Because what God wants us to realize is that we must depend on what God has done for us. And what God did for us was sending his son Jesus to take our place. Jesus had the praise of angels. He was in heaven. He had the the most angelic choirs singing to him all the time. He had everything he needed and everything he, he needs right there in heaven with him. And yet he left it. He left it all to come save us. Paul talks about it in Philippians, how he humbled himself, taking on the form of a serpent, emptying himself of all this, and descending to the lowest place in his service to us. We know what that lowest place is. It's death on a cross. It's suffering hell for us. He took all of our pride upon himself and he went there. The most humiliating place, becoming the great sinner and washing us clean. And then he rose from the dead and God exalted him to the highest place at the right hand of God the Father. All this he did for us so that he may come and say to us, friend, brother, sister, come here and sit by me. Or as one of the children in the early service said, come sit at the place I saved just for you. That's what Jesus has done for us. He became the humble life that he calls us to live. And he walked it perfectly in our place. And then he died and rose, giving us eternal life as a free gift. And as we recognize our need for the Savior, as we see it, we see the wonderful truth that God has laid out before us, that he has forgiven all of our sins. And what does he do? Through word and sacrament, he pours that into our hand and he lifts us up out of the dust and the ashes and calls us his dear children. And so what that does then is it frees us. It frees us from trying to get the honor and praise of people in this world, of puffing ourselves up to make ourselves feel better because we know what God says about us through Christ Jesus. We are the sons and daughters of of the Heavenly Father, the King of the universe. We have a place with Him at His heavenly table. We will be with Him forever and ever, and He will raise us up in our bodies to be with Him. That's honor, and that's glory. That's truly being exalted, and you didn't do anything to deserve it. I didn't either. It's all out of His mercy. So that frees us to walk humbly. Humbleness doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. We often can think about that in humility, right? Just hide me in a corner, no one look at me, no one pay any attention to me. No, really it means thinking of yourself less and thinking of Jesus more and then thinking of others more. It's recognizing your gifts and your strengths and knowing that God has given given them to you for you to use for the benefit of others. And so you can go serving humbly with those gifts and talents and abilities 
that God has so blessed you with. You don't have to look for honorific positions. It's positions that you already have. As father and mother, brother and sister, employer, employee, uh, student, teacher, all those different roles, we go humbly serving our God, knowing that he has given us everything. And as we serve, we do so unselfishly. That's the other thing that Jesus wanted to teach those Pharisees that day, and us as well, to serve with unselfish actions. And after he told that parable, he turned to the host of the party, that Pharisee who was there, and he told them, when you invite people, don't invite rich or your brothers or your family or anyone that can repay you, because what would often happen? You would invite someone knowing and hoping what? If I invited them to my party, they gained a little honor and respect, they're going to invite me to their party, and then I will be given a little honor and respect. And so you're doing all these things to get something, really. Jesus wanted them to see that we give unselfishly. We act unselfishly, not looking to get anything back. And so he told the Pharisee and us to invite those who can't repay you. And why? Because we know what we get at the resurrection of the righteous. We get eternal life. This is a good thing to be reminded of because we all need to be reminded to act unselfishly. No, excuse me, knowing that we have our, everything already in Christ. And it's something that needs to be taught from the earliest of ages and even as we are adults too. I was reminded of this truth that being unselfish is something unnatural to us. We're very selfish all the time. I was reminded of this a couple weeks ago. The daycare at which Carter's at, uh, they send us updates. They give like little lessons and pictures and things that they were doing. And he's nine months, right? And they, already started, they, were, they were already starting to teach them how to share. Whether or not they can comprehend, that's a different story. But it was kind of neat to see, oh good, they're teaching them this. But then they sent the picture, and I remember texting Mari, I'm glad that they're teaching them this, but that sure doesn't look like Carter sharing. It definitely looks like Carter reaching for the ball to try and grab it himself, Right? I, we laugh at that, it's kind of cute, it's kind of funny to think about how that is, but we do that all the time. That's how we are by nature, to reach and grab to make sure that we get something out of every exchange. But when we have Christ, we don't have to do that. We can serve unselfishly, not trying to get something in return, but simply to give, just as Christ has so given everything to us. We don't have to try and be repaid in this world because we know what we will be getting in heaven, which is eternal life with our God at his mercy and freely as a gift. So that frees us again from trying to clamor and grab and make sure that we are always repaid in this world. We don't have to be because we know what Christ gives us. So as we invite people to our homes, we do so with the joy of knowing just to simply do it. As we help people in the stores or at work or in school, wherever it may be, we again do so with the joy of knowing that we can just do this out of love for Christ. And as we do so, perhaps we will be repaid one day. We're not getting heaven as a free gift or as a reward for what we have done. We get it as a free gift. But what might happen when we get to heaven? There's one of those people that we invited that came to our house, came to our church that we helped, that we brought into contact with Christ through our actions and through our words. And what might they say when we get to heaven at the resurrection of the righteous? Thank you for bringing me Jesus. You shared him with me. And through your words that Jesus spoke through you, now I have faith because Christ worked faith in my heart. What a reward that will be, a repayment to see that Jesus used us through our humble attitudes, our unselfish actions, that he worked in us to bring that good news to other people. Walk the way of the Christian, that humble attitude, humbly knowing that God will call you by name at the last day and sit you by his side. Walk with unselfish actions, knowing that you have everything you already need, possibly could want or imagine in your Savior Jesus. Walk the way of the Christian until that resurrection of the righteous when he says, friend, come up here and sit by my side. Amen.